Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rental at a time, back with his Thursday guest, Mr. Jonathan Twomley. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing very well, Michael. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, sorry we missed you last week. I think you were out at an event uh, just uh, helping more and more people. So we we missed you, but uh, thank you for coming back. Absolutely. Always happy to be here. And I always, I always miss it when I miss it. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I... <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's a lot of fun for me, too. We get to talk yeah. about new and different things. Uh, something that I've had on my channel the last couple of weeks is it appears uh, that rents are getting soft. I believe it was reported about a week and a half ago that rents ticked down something like 1.5% mm -hmm. on a national average, which was really surprising because Q3, it's usually strong, right? It's usually, it includes the summer. It's when people move and renew. And there was, there was some like, Hey, this is, this is different. Uh, then I did a video with my uh, Tuesday expert, Beth, who is in Seattle, um, kind of East side of Seattle where, you know, the mm -hmm. average median home is, is 900 grand. So expensive part of town. Uh, but she's also a landlord. She owns a few rentals and she talked about she had to lower rent and she was going, hey, is this just time of season? Is, is what's going on? She hasn't had to do that in a long time. And uh, what I saw in the responses, because the engagement on that video, bless you, the engagement vi on that video has been out outstanding. Lots of comments, lots of feedback from other folks. And it, it does look like in a lot of the country, again, based on one video, based on maybe 40 comments, that rents are appearing soft and it's not only apartments. That's where I always said it was like, Hey, apartments are going to get soft houses or not, but it's possible that rents are getting soft across the board. And maybe this is just, just what I'm thinking is what's happening is a lot of would be sellers and Airbnb owners are turning into monthly rentals as a way to keep it because they don't want to sell it because of their low rate and Airbnb is not working out. So maybe what we're seeing is just a lot more inventory for monthly rentals and more, more supply, same demand equals lower prices. Maybe that's what's going on. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think that, so you're seeing this in multifamily as well, right? And there's, I was trying to find this article that flashed across my inbox yesterday about declining rents. Um, but to share with you, but there's definitely some softening with rents. And I, and I think, you know, I'm not at all surprised by this because rents grew so much over the last couple of years as a result of COVID and, and the stimulus checks and whatever else was behind um, the increase in rents that it couldn't be sustained at that level, right? Those yeah. kind of increases. Plus, on top of that, you've got now these inflationary pressures. Um, but I think even without inflation, I think you would have started to see some pushback on rent increases because the, the tenant base just couldn't keep up with yeah. it, right? I so, um, but on top of that, adding in, you know, just the pocketbook issues of inflation, people are just feeling more squeezed and they're just not coming up with the money, right? And I think probably there are some people who are now thinking, hey, double up, et cetera. Um, I, I think your point about... Um, at least in the you know the the home rental market about uh, you know Airbnbs coming on as uh, you know long term rentals that makes sense to me because I know that in the Airbnb market there was something like a twenty five percent increase in the number of Airbnb listings between twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two because of the amazing demand in twenty twenty one a lot of people came into the market because of that and. You know, naturally, they then drove down the Airbnb rents uh, for this previous season. And so I think a lot of those people have realized that uh, they're not going, especially people who are um, renting to make money. Like, you know, I have an Airbnb, but we just rent it out to cover the cost of the house. Like, so right. we don't, we're not looking to, you know, making money is great, but we don't have to. Uh, but there are a lot of people who bought those short term rentals and they need to make money. They've got mortgages on those properties uh, and they didn't come out where they expected to last season because of the, the you know 25% increase in yeah. availability of Airbnbs. So I think you may see some of those now, you know, shifting into the long-term rental column, which is definitely going to, you know, have the same effect you know, for mm -hmm. long-term rentals. Right. So, um, but yeah, that's, I'm definitely seeing the same phenomenon here and it's it's making it you know the flux with uh the multifamily market right now is making it harder to underwrite to underwrite deals right because at the same time as you've got a lot of uncertainty around interest rates and where they're 
not not uncertainty about the trend, but uncertainty about how about the. It's that way, Jonathan. It's going that way. (laughs) Right. Everybody knows that, but I mean, but you don't know how far, right? And you don't know what the timing is. So, but it's making it harder to underwrite multifamily deals. Mm -hmm. Plus, if now you've got to contend with, uh, you know, the possibility of rents flat not flatlining, or even declining, and Um, expenses going up. Yeah. Yeah, and expenses going up, and sellers still expecting to get paid what they thought they were going to get paid in January of this year, it makes it very hard for multifamily deals to get done. So you're definitely seeing a softening of the market in multifamily for sure. Yeah. Well, I think, again, this is an area where you play. I watch from afar and just admire it. When when you look at the big apartments and I see syndications, I haven't seen a lot in the last couple of weeks, but I, I, I was seeing them all the time as accredited investor. And it wasn't, I don't remember anybody's rent projections being less than 5% for, for a year, for at least a year. And that, that always bothered me because that was statistically above normal right now. It wasn't the 20% that we saw in 2020 or 2021, but it always felt like, Hey, this is going to snap back, snap back to reality, reversion to the mean, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, if you have a couple of years of 20, who's to say you can't have a negative two or a negative three, Uh, and thus your NOI gets all hurt. Plus inflation is still raging and insurance costs are going up and, you know, utilities are going to go up if you're in a cold weather area. It's, it's, it feels like a lot of the deals I looked at had bad assumptions, which is why I didn't do any. And and now it feels like it's, it's kind of, it's kind of building that direction. And plus we have a lot more inventory coming on in some markets, at least in multifamily. So it, it feels like it's going to be an interesting couple of years. Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm I'm shocked when you tell me that you saw deals where people were underwriting five percent rent growth. Because even when we were getting five percent rent growth, I would not underwrite five percent rent growth, right? Just just in the same way that even if the you know the market vacancy it was ninety seven percent, I was not going to underwrite ninety seven percent, right? Nice. So you'd always underwrite you know more conservatively. It, it definitely stopped you from getting deals done. But I think a lot of people were just you know happy to project the current uh, market environment onto the future, which is always a bad idea. And now you see that that's, you know, very suddenly uh, been proven wrong, right? And I, and I agree with you. I, you know, I have seen also myself a lot fewer, you know, syndication deals floating past me. I, I, you know, people have not been asking me to raise money for their deals in the last couple of months, right? So I think there's definitely a lot of people now stepping into kind of the wait and see camp Mm. because they just uh, they don't really know what's going on. Um, You know, I do, I spoke with somebody on my own podcast yesterday who has a number of deals under contract, uh, you know, but he was talking about the, the problem with kind of getting debt that makes sense uh, and getting sellers kind of off of their, you know, stars in the eyes pricing that they had been able to get the last couple of years. Yeah. And when you look at the bigger picture, you and I did a video probably a year ago about just changing a few variables on a deal. Uh, and it really impacts the value, right? You, you, you take the cap rate, you lower the NOI and, you know, you raise the cap rate, lower the NOI. I mean, the value of a property can have a huge swing. Yeah. And, and we've seen interest rates. I mean, what are, what are interest rate on commercial debt today? Cause it's not quite residential debt, right? Residential debt hit a high of 7.22% 20 year high. What does a commercial debt look like 30% down or whatever the right structure is? Yeah. I mean, I have, I have not looked in the last couple of weeks, but um, the last, you know, deal I was actively involved in was at, at 5% which is a lot higher than, you know, it has been. I'm sure probably interest rates have gone up a little bit more since then. Um, So, yeah, I mean, you're definitely seeing it. And I think the real problem more than the interest rate per se is the variability in it between the time that you go into contract on one set of assumptions and the time you close, which may, the the ground may have shifted beneath your feet. And that that I've definitely seen happening uh, to, you know, to syndicators, or I mean, not just syndicators, people in the, who are buying multifamily property and using debt, um, suddenly being told like the day before they're closing that they have to come up with, you know, 30% equity rather than 25% or what have you, right? So, and deals getting, uh, you know, kicked back 
you know, one, th one thing that's definitely happening, e even though sellers are not, um, well, I can't say that. There are some sellers who see the, the reality of the situation. And if they bought early enough and they have, you know, their basis is low enough, they're still going ahead with sales because they're still making a profit. People who bought more recently don't may not have a choice. Um, they can't lower their prices, right? But um, what you are seeing is sellers being very generous with extensions on closing, right? Because they, I think, recognize the fact that, you know, they have a contracted price that they're happy with now mm -hmm. and they're not going to get that price if they right. fall out they put of it contract. Back. Yeah. And, you know, so they're, they're letting people, you know, extend to get more time to raise more equity if they need to. Um, so that's, that's a sign of softening for sure. Um, but yeah, there's the market is the market is shifting and it's going to lead to opportunity. I mean, it's it's I am excited about where we are maybe next year in this market. But I think mm -hmm. right now it's it's tough because there's just not that people have different expectations. Buyers are much more cautious than they were before. Sellers are still demanding what they wanted. Uh, and, you know, you don't have a meeting of the minds and you, you probably won't until some people start getting foreclosed on. Mm -hmm. And once that happens and the banks get start getting skittish and start pulling back even more than they are now, the sellers, you know, will not have a choice. They will have to lower their expectations. And, you know, for those people who underwrote really aggressively, they're either going to make a lot less money than they thought, or they're going to have to hold for a lot longer than they planned, uh, or, you know, maybe even get, uh, foreclosed on or have to do capital calls or what have you. So yeah. So I can be this pretty is, time for the next this is, this 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 is kind of what we've been kind of painting. You and I kind of thought we might see this in 2019, 20, and then obviously we're, you know, shaken about by the pandemic. Uh but we, we never really paid for that recession that you and I saw coming in 19, uh, which is why I sold apartments in 19, late 19. Um but yeah it, it's gonna be interesting because it re it really feels like every assumption is going the opposite direction on deals, right? If you did a deal in the last year or in a deal today, your cost of capital is higher, your cap rates higher, uh, rent rents are softening, vacancies are up. It, it just it costs are up, right? Taxes, insurance, labor. It just it feels like every variable on your spreadsheet is going the wrong way. And when you're dealing with hundreds or or thousands of units, those little changes really blow up and impact the value of an asset. I mean, if you're it depends on how you structured your deal. If you structured your deal conservatively, you're probably fine. Your I think I think your risk is mostly not making as much money as you anticipated and having your investors grumble, right? Mm. But um, you're probably fine. You're, you're not like at risk of impairing capital. But if you were really aggressive and you you bought into the idea that um, it's all going up forever, and you know, <laughs> a, and a lot of people really, you know, a lot of people looked at the one variable and one variable only, which was the, the supposed housing shortage, right? Now there is a housing shortage for sure, but what does that mean exactly? Like, does that, does that mean that it's going to, does that mean that it translates into automatic safety or automatic wins for your property? No, it, no, it doesn't because just because there's a housing shortage, that's just this number that economists come up with where they say, well, we have this many households and there's this many, you know, housing starts and they don't match, right? So we have a housing shortage. But that 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 doesn't mean that like the market is going to bail you out if you do a bad deal, right? right. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean that uh, you still can't get hurt because yeah. So there's this projected house you know, household formation going on, but people, you know move in with their parents, they move in with roommates, they move in with, yep. you know, other people to, to, to make ends meet. And um, so, yeah, maybe there's a, a quote unquote, there should be a household formed there. Maybe there even was, but maybe this young married couple is now living in their parents' basement and they're not living uh, on their own. Right. Or they're they're or they're, I mean, hell, you see this in New York city, you know, two young married couples who have no kids, like sharing a four bedroom apartment or something. Right. So, right. Yeah. um, so it's, it's, 
just because there's a housing shortage, quote unquote, doesn't mean that it's safe. You still have to do the deal right, right? Mm -hmm. And but I think a lot of people were just looking at, uh, you know, going to buy everything they could, and for a while that worked. And that you know that that model works until it stops working. That's always the, yeah. the risk. I, I just and also I want to just make a point sir, about what you're commenting a minute ago about the recession that didn't happen that we're now paying for. I actually, frankly, think it's worse now than it would have been in 2019. Oh, no question. Yeah, yeah. it's we're paying with interest. Yeah, yeah. And the reason, the reason for that is is manifold. But it's, you know, look, we we because of coronavirus and the response to it. Um, we wound up creating a, a bubble and now the bubble has popped because of rising interest rates. I think if we'd had a recession then, it would have been a lot more gradual. It would have seen like a softening of demand, but it wouldn't have been catast catastrophic, right? I think Agreed. what you're seeing now is a lot of things coming together all at once because of what we just went through and yeah. and the, the unrealistic expectations that got set during that period of time where people really let go of discipline in, in doing deals and uh, and frankly the incentives were there for them to let go right I mean and, and some going, and some were rewarded let's not forget oh, some some no, uh, some killed it crushed that's it. what I mean no I mean yeah. if you people were generating millions and millions and millions of dollars in in syndication fees because retail investors were throwing money at them mm -hmm. right and uh, and for a lot of people that temptation was too great to resist and so they adjusted their quote unquote conservative underwriting to mm -hmm. include 5% rent growth, yeah. right? And, uh, and 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 now here we are, where it's all it's all kind of ground to a halt very fast rather than kind of a slow, I think we would have seen before just kind of like a softening and a, maybe some marginal buyers having more trouble and yeah. some you know marginal investors having doubts and stuff. But now I think you're, what you're seeing is like everybody is like, I don't know what's going on, so I'm doing yeah. nothing for the time being. Yeah, I think I think to 2019 to today, I think 2019 we we took some chips off the table on some assets that were just hard to manage and had a decent price. It was more about uh, headache management. Um, mm -hmm. What and, and you're right. I don't I don't you know I don't see anybody really getting hurt if 2019 kind of rolled to 20 was allowed to happen. Uh, but now I see real some people getting hurt. I've seen some deal structures that just my my math brain can't understand how that's going to work out, right? When that bridge debt comes due in a year or that debt covenant gets called. I mean, best case capital raise, maybe you extend and pretend and you you lock up money for 10 years instead of five. I mean, there's not a lot of good outcomes uh, on some of the things I've seen recently. And, you know, I think you're right. People just stopped being conservative and they just did. And, and a lot of newbies, that, that's what really I saw with, with syndications two years ago we talked about is, the, I go to meetups. And actually, I have one I'm going to tonight, not because I like sharing our story one rental at a time. But I like the interaction after. And I remember several meetups in San Jose, California, in in late '19, where more than half the room were syndicators. Right? These were tech workers. They had our shoes and stocks, and they had a bunch of friends. And more than half the people were syndicators. They weren't into the one rental at a time thing. They saw easy money. I'm like, oh my god, this can't end well. I mean, just. I mean, in a room of 80 people, maybe you should have two or three. You shouldn't have 40, right? It's just like, wow, how is this How is this going to end? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure a lot of those people were probably, uh, you know, they weren't sponsoring their own deals. They were probably raising money. Oh, they were raising, of course. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. so yeah, so it's, it's, I think it's a lot just, of them were. You know, yeah, probably. Listen, because the tech world is, I know some people who, in the, in, that area who, who grew syndication businesses really right. fast because they had access to all that tech money. Right. Yeah, exactly. And so exactly. they were able to, to do mm -hmm. massive like deals. I couldn't even imagine doing myself that, uh, but, but, you know, you get a team of like 25 or 30 tech guys raising money from all their tech friends and they could That's raise big, mil big millions money. and millions of dollars oh, all in, a, in an evening. Yeah. In yeah. An evening. So, uh, but there was also, I think a lot of sort of um, like frenzy around it, right. There was a lot of FOMO and a lot of, you know, so, I mean, there's, there's going to be some, there's always like an equal and opposite reaction, right? And, and yes. I think that it went up too fast, and mm -hmm. that caused problems. And uh, now we're seeing the comeuppance. So um, very cool. 
but that's going to lead to opportunity and i'm excited about that so oh, I, mean, I do too. want to say all the all the i mean you guys you and i are talking a little bit doom and gloom there's going to be some pain for sure over the next few months but i, I think that we finally have the opportunity now to see a more normal market emerge and you know to to squeeze out a lot of um you know marginal players and squeeze out a lot of over aggressive players and those people will get hurt and never come back because nobody will trust them again, right? And a lot of those investors will get burned and never come back, right? Mm -hmm. And that means that for the rest of us who are still in it, there's going to be a lot of opportunity to buy properties at attractive prices again. And I mean, I don't know if it'll ever return to where it was because now, you know, these these this kind of investment is on the radar of a lot of people that it never was on before. So I think there has been a little bit of a shift in the perception of these deals. And that that means that, you know, I'm, I'm not sure we're going to see, you know, eight caps on deals mm -hmm. again anytime soon. However, I do think that we're going to see something more realistic uh, and, um, and, and a little bit, just a bit more meat on the bone and less risk for buyers uh, who are able to put capital together, you know, who are able to get the debt and uh, I think it's going to be a good time for those people in the next couple of years. Yeah, I think what's going to happen is is you and I've been waiting for this environment. We thought we'd get a we thought we'd get a small bite in 2020. Uh, that didn't happen, obviously. And and we were you know we were left um, not doing deals, and others came in high on the hog. Now it's time for them to pay up, and I, I'm excited. Um, you know, I look forward to working with banks and whatnot, because we've done it before. We have a reputation. We bought directly from banks in, in our little market. Uh, and I look forward to doing it again because, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's anytime there's pain, there's also opportunity. And, and we've been waiting for this. So Jonathan, you always underwrite deals very conservatively, uh, which is probably why you didn't do a lot of deals in 2020 and 2021, which is okay. Uh, but now's the time. So where can somebody come follow you and see what you're doing? Yeah, so there's a couple of places you can come join my free Facebook group, which is the Multifamily Investment Community, on obviously on Facebook. Uh, so just search for that on Facebook, and there's a couple of questions you need to answer, so please answer them. Uh, if you come from the show, I'd love to hear about it, so just drop it into the, the, the note that you leave me. Um, you can also get on my investor list directly by Googling Two Bridges Asset Management, LLC. There's an investor form that you can fill out. Um, unfortunately, we only deal with accredited investors, but if you are accredited, happy to uh, have you come on board and my assistant will reach out to you uh, to schedule a call if you'd like to talk with me. And also want to let everybody know that we are having a conference April 26th to 28th, 2023 in Las Vegas. Uh, and um, it's going to be a great conference, uh, two days full of all kinds of multifamily wisdom. And I'm just also letting you know that if you are a paid up member of my coaching community, this will be a free event for you. So, uh, you know, a good incentive to sign up for my uh, my community. So uh, if you want information about that, go to apartmentinvestorsclub.com and you'll see all the information. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.